Welcome to the sixth lecture of Advanced Dynamics 4428. Today we're going to be talking about analytical dynamics. So today's goal is really to learn the how to find the equations of motion for a system of particles using Lagrange's equations. And to understand the meaning of the degrees of freedom of a system, what generalized coordinates and forces are, and then about constraints in a system. To learn how to determine the forces of constraint and internal forces using Lagrange's multipliers. The degrees of freedom are the number of the ways that a system may move, each way being a direction independent of all other directions. For example, if we take a look here, maybe we have a particle with no constraints in 3D. It's three degrees of freedom. A particle along a wire in 3D, well, we've gone from three degrees of freedom to one degree of freedom because the particle can move along the wire but cannot move in two completely different directions perpendicular to that wire in 3D. Two particles on a plane, all together we'd have four degrees of freedom because this particular particle could move in one of two orthogonal directions. There are two perp perpendicular directions in the plane but it's held to be on that plane, say. And then this particle over here, it can move along the plane anywhere at once as well, perhaps, but it's held to be on that plane. So this, this particular particle loses one of three degrees of freedom as well as this one. And so instead of having six degrees of freedom, we're down to four. Something you might not have noticed is that the number of degrees of freedom is the same as the number of equations of motion required to completely describe the system. So, for example, we go back to look at example one. It has three degrees of freedom. Then we'd have to have three equations of motion. And this is uh, the vector equation of motion. And, in fact, we only need one vector equation, don't we? Because we wrap all of the directions up into, uh, into this equation with the bold fonts and all that. And that becomes three separate equations. So there's one two, and three equations for this. If there are constraints, however, and as in example three, we need uh, equations to describe the constraint, and then equations of motion for the unconstrained behavior, the degrees of freedom. So, for example three, there are two constraints, right? If we go back and look, For equation three, there are two constraints. We have a constraint on this system, this particle keeping it in the plane, and a constraint on this particle keeping it in the plane. Okay. And if we look at the particle, in the second example, a particle along the wire, we actually have a couple of constraints as well. For example, two this should be, and there are two constraints. Maybe we have the particle along the wire. Here's our wire, and here's a particle where the wire is along, and it's held along that wire. And if we say that r is our vector to this particular particle for some fixed point O, say, then we'd have r sub t along the, the tangential direction, r sub n along the normal direction or binormal direction, depends on how you'd like to write it. And then we have E sub s along the s direction. All right. So in this way we've written it here, rt dot is equal to zero and rn dot is equal to zero as well. The only way it can move is along the curve defined by s. So these two represent two equations of constraints. We had three directions that the particles the particle could move in, and now after two equations of constraint, we have only one degree of freedom. Generally, if you have, say, n particles moving in x dimensions with L constraints, the number of degrees of freedom is x times n minus L, where x is either one, two, or three, and this is ref refers to the dimensionality as I've written here. All right. Sometimes it's easy to forget a constrained equation, say. So, for example, degrees of freedom. Um, if you have a particle moving in 2D, then you might say, well, it has four degrees of freedom. This is x is 2. This is your x. It's equal to 2. And you have two particles. 
you don't have any constraints, so you have four degrees of freedom. Another way to write that, though, is that it's moving into, it's moving in 3D, okay, but it's confined to the XY plane. So if we say that the degrees of freedom, this is our x is equal to 3 times uh, two particles, that's the number of particles here, x times n, isn't it? So that's our x times n term, minus the number of constraints, L, and that's, that's equal to 2. We get 4 again, and these two are the same answer. Makes sense, they should be exactly the same, no matter how we look at it. In any case, the degrees of freedom are independent of the number of coordinates you choose to represent the system. And this is an important thing to, to remember, that this is always true. If we look at a simple pendulum, you're not going to change the number of degrees of freedom of the system because you change the number of degrees of freedom that you have. After all, if this, if this pendulum is, is moving back and forth in a plane, then it has exactly one degree of freedom, no more, no less. We could define it with one coordinate, and we usually do, say, like use theta, where theta is defined from the vertical, and that's our degree of freedom. But then also we could use x and y, and some, some do sometimes, to use x and y. But there is a constraint equation. x is related to y through the length of the bob L. x squared plus y squared is equal to L squared. That's our constraint equation. As well, we could use three coordinates we wanted to, x, y, and then we could put in our theta that we used over here before. We wouldn't need to, but we could. And so we'd have uh, three coordinates, one degree of freedom, plus two constraint equations. We'd have x and y is related to get to each other through L, and then theta is related to, to y and x through this relationship with the triangle. A tangent theta is equal to y over x. If you choose n coordinates, the number of the constraint equations you're going to need is n minus the degrees of freedom. So you're, the number of constraints that you're going to need, L, is equal to n minus DOF. The reason we went all th through all of that is because of generalized coordinates. Now you've used generalized coordinates in the past to describe motions of, the motion of systems. Generalized coordinates are not necessarily tied to a specific coordinate system. For example, the pendulum may be described by either polar coordinates, Cartesian coordinates, or some other coordinate system. Okay, so here's the polar coordinates, e sub r, e sub theta, okay, and Cartesian coordinates, e sub x and e sub y, and we could define them in some other corner of coordinate system over here at the right, like I'll call it the goofy coordinate system where we have x prime, where it's some distance from over here at the left, uh, the distance from where the bob is attached, uh, given by L. If we have only one degree of freedom, only one coordinate is necessary. All three coordinate systems are generalized coordinate systems. So if we look back at this system, all of these coordinate systems are generalized coordinate systems. They're not, each of these coordinate directions, they're not necessarily tied to a specific coordinate system. They might be, but maybe not. You can express a relationship between the coordinates as well, right? So for r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared, theta is equal to inverse tangent of y over x. Those two relationships relate to polar and, coordinate, polar and Cartesian coordinate systems. And x equals x prime minus l, that relates the goofy coordinate system on the right with the Cartesian coordinate system. One thing that you must have is you must pick at least as many coordinates as there are degrees of freedom. This is why This is why the first question is always DOF. How many degrees of freedom do you have? If you have more coordinates than degrees of freedom, then you must have equations of constraint to, to handle the difference. And you must have at least enough, but if you have more, then you need constraints to handle it. If n is equal to the number of degrees of freedom and the coordinates are not dependent on each other, then you have a set of independent generalized coordinates. And this is the most ideal situation because you have just enough to describe what's going on, and they're not dependent on each other. They're not interfering with each other's motion. Okay, so for example, let's look at a two degree of freedom system. We have two, two bobs right here. Here's one, and here's another. And we have two coordinates. Well, if we have two coordinates and we have two degrees of freedom, we're set, aren't we? Right? Two degrees of freedom? Well, two coordinates, we're done. The problem is, is that the way we've defined the coordinates isn't quite, uh, isn't quite appropriate. Because if we move this lower mass, maybe this has a mass, 
m and this has a mass m, say, if we move that lower mass, then we don't know what's going on because we don't have a coordinate to describe its motion. We only can talk about what's happening with the upper mass. With the lower mass moving, then we need to have a coordinate that is dis describing what's going on. So you might say, well, we have two degrees of freedom, two coordinates. What's wrong? Well, the problem is, is that x and theta are related to each other. x is equal to sine theta. They're dependent on each other, aren't they? So they're not an independent set of, of coordinates, so therefore they're not an in independent set of generalized coordinates. And furthermore, if we look here, then if you change theta 1, you change the state of this system. And if you change theta 2, you change the state of this bob. All right? And it doesn't necessarily affect uh, the behavior of the other coordinate. These are independent generalized coordinates. The relationship between Cartesian and a generalized set of coordinates, we can write these things out. And forgive me, but this is a bit lengthy, but don't treat it as being anything really very complicated. It's, it's easy. Relationship between the Cartesian coordinates, these are your Cartesian coordinates, and over here on the right-hand side, these represent all the generalized coordinates. And then we have time t here, over here on the right-hand side. So we can write them, uh, the generalized coordinates, um, in terms of Cartesian coordinates and vice versa, as long as we throw in time as well. So for example, Cartesian to polar, uh, x1 is equal to x, is equal to r cosine theta. That's a function of r and theta. So if you look up here, x1 is a function the first function of r and theta. And notice we didn't have to have t. You don't necessarily have to have t in there. And so we might say, well, that's q1. R, r here is q1. And in your theta, well, that's q2. That's q1 cosine q2. And in x2 is equal to q1 sine q2. So we've converted from Cartesian to, well, not polar, but a generalized set of coordinates. Okay. And an interesting thing about your Cartesian coordinates is, or your generalized coordinates, is that they may use different root units. Here, notice that Q1 is in maybe meters, say, but then Q2, Q2 might be in radians. Okay, so that's enough about generalized coordinates for now. Let's go on and talk about constraints. It turns out that you can write different things about how constraints are behaving um, de depending on how they're defined. And the reason that this is important is because it helps you figure out how you're going to solve the problem. First off, a holonomic, H-O-L-O-N-O-M-I-C, a holonomic constraint may be written as an explicit expression of the coordinates in time. So we can just write it out as in, term, in terms of coordinates in time. So for example, for the pendulum, if we had the pendulum bob described by x and y, we could say that x squared plus y squared minus l squared is equal to zero. That's explicitly writing out. There's no, there's no derivatives here. There's no inequalities. There's no integrations. There's no nothing. It's x, y, and those are our coordinates. And we have l squared there as a constant. Okay. If we notice that maybe our, if we don't have any time dependence, right? We don't have time written in here. Okay, then we say that this particular constraint is also scleronomic. So a holonomic constraint may be scleronomic if there's no time that's written in there explicitly. If we said, though, that the pendulum maybe is getting shorter with respect to time, maybe the uh, length of our pendulum here is a constant L0 minus 3t, then how we would say x and y are related together would be with the minus 9t squared. So x squared plus y squared minus 9t squared is equal to 0. And the constraint would not be scleronomic, on the other hand. It would be rheonomic. Rheonomic means depend, dependent on time. Scleronomic means there's no time dependence. Holonomic is either scleronomic or rheonomic. It's not always possible to write a, a constraint in an equation like, like this up here at the top. We can't always write out holonomic constraints. Sometimes we have an, inequalities. These commonly occur when talking about constraints with contacts, like a bouncing ball. So something like these. Either the ball is on the surface or above it. On it or above it. Right? So we always would say that z is greater than or equal to zero. Right? And there's also times when we can only write a constraint in terms of differentials. 
say um, dx ds is equal to r sine alpha and dy ds is equal to r cosine alpha. These appear from when you have a coin, coin rolling that might be on its way to might be on its way to falling over. So this this path that's following is along S and the angle that it's at with respect to the horizontal, maybe that's that's alpha, and as it's move, doing its thing, that will tell you what's happening with the, the coin. Unfortunately, they can only be written as differentials. You can't integrate it, and so we can't write it out explicitly in terms of the variables themselves. We have to write it out in terms of differentials. So, in other words, these aren't explicit either. Constraints with such inequalities and constraints with differentials are said to be non-holonomic constraints. So, important to remember. If you have a constraint, ask yourself, can it be written explicitly in terms of the variables and time t? No, it's non-holonomic. If it can, it's holonomic. Just that simple. If it's holonomic, does time appear explicitly? If not, it's clearonomic. It's the best situation. If time appears explicitly in the equation, it's said to be rehonomic. If a system has at least one non-holonomic constraint, the system is non-holonomic. Right, so if you have one bad apple, the entire barrel is bad. If a holonomic system has at least one rehonomic constraint, the system is said to be rehonomic. This means that T appears in the one constraint equation, that means that it appears throughout the constraint equations, all right? The only way to handle non-holonomic constraints that have inequalities is to separate the problem into two separate ones. One, when the inequality holds, so for example, when you have the bouncing ball problem, when, right here when the ball is hitting the surface, and one where the inequality holds. So when you go back and look, and one when the ball is above the surface. Whenever it's hitting the surface, you have to change it into a different kind of problem, and then look at it while it's going through the air, and then when it's hitting again. And then analyze the system with respect to time. These kind of problems are usually pretty tough. We have, um, you can ask Daniel Liu, for example, if you like. Um, he's handling one of these kind of problems. Non-holonomic systems, the differential constraints, are a different matter. We can write uh, constraints uh, like, as, like this. Uh, we have M constraint equations. Notice that it's not the same as degrees of freedom. This is the number of degrees of freedom is, is n. And m constraint equations, OK, this is the difference. So if we look here, we can write this out. We say that dx ds is equal to sine alpha, which is dx minus sine alpha ds is equal to 0. And so then this is actually 1 sitting in front of this. 1 times dx plus a minus sine alpha ds. And so then a11 dq1 if, if q1 is x and dq2 if that's ds, and then we don't have anything in front of a dt, there's no dt there, so we just have zero, right, don't we? So then a12 is equal to minus sine alpha, as shown here, a11 is one, and q1 is x, and q2 is s, there you go. Okay, so that's enough about constraints. We'll actually come back to this and talk a, bit, a, a lot about this later on when we talk about using Lagrange multipliers. I understand most of you have never seen virtual work analysis, and we're going to take a look at that now. Let's define what's called a virtual displacement, which is neither a true or even an infinitesimal displacement, but happens to be consistent with the constraints. So if you have a system that has a consistent, is consistent with the constraints, then um, we'll say that we'll have a virtual displacement. All right. So if there are two configurations of a particular system, we'll define a virtual displacement that changes the configuration from one to another, called delta. Now this is delta, all right? Delta r sub i for the ith particle. In this displacement, it's a virtual displacement, meaning that we're looking at two different configurations separated by this displacement delta r sub i, and in between the two displacement and two configurations, the time doesn't change. We're actually looking just at two different configurations at the same time, exactly. 
So if we look, for example, we have configuration one. Here's our configuration one for our bob, for our, uh, our pendulum, and this is a configuration two for our pendulum. I'm just saying we're looking for some point. We're going to look at where the bob is at. For configuration one here, and that's R. Configuration two, well, that's R prime. Delta R here, then, is R prime minus R. Turns out that if you do a little bit of mathematics and what's called functional calculus, the virtual operator here works exactly like a differential D. So if we said D theta, then we know how we would look for, say, D sine theta, because that would be equal to, to cosine theta D theta, right? Well, in that case, then, it turns out that this virtual operator delta, that is, works exactly like a differential D. So delta sine theta is equal to cosine theta delta theta. Okay, so you remember the work is equal to the sum over a bunch of particles, say, it's just the summation of, of F, the external forces on, on the ice particle, dotted by the displacement of that ice particle as it goes from position A to position B. Well, if we look at the virtual work, we'll define the virtual work as delta W, okay, as we go from one, one configuration to another in, in, in no time. We look at one configuration to another and how much work would be done from going from one configuration to the other. Delta W would be equal to delta of all of this. It turns out that you can switch, put this inside the, the summation sign and delta W is equal to the summation for my is equal to 1 to N of delta of R sub AI to R sub BI F sub, F sub I dot delta D R sub I. Turns out in a process that is well beyond the, this course that this is the summation from I is equal to 1 to N of delta of F sub I R sub I. So if we can use this delta operator on this term, then we found our virtual work. We'll choose, only, we'll choose to only change the configuration R, not the forces. And there's a couple of different ways to handle this virtual work. We could either go about looking at delta F sub I dot R sub I plus F sub I uh, delta R sub I, but again, for reasons that are a little bit obscure for the purpose of this course, we're going to ignore this first term, and we're going to say that the forces never change direction, nor do they change magnitude over the change of configurations. We're going to say that the only thing that's changing is the configuration, and we're going to call that the virtual work. So how much work do the constraints do through virtual displacement delta R? Well, let's look at the pendulum. It's a good example. We have uh, a bob with length L here. We do a free body diagram. I promise we wouldn't do any more of these, but we won't have to do too many more of these. That has a tension in the bob T. T is a force of constraint. Now, how much does the length of the pendulum change from R to R prime? So if it goes from here to here, how much does this, this length actually change? It doesn't change at all, does it? So if we take T delta R, that's actually equal to zero because there's no work being done by that force of constraint. There's nothing it's, it's doing. It doesn't have any movement along that particular direction. It moves perpendicular to that direction, but not along the direction of the applied force T. The, this force of constraint does no work through a virtual displacement delta R. This is a characteristic of constraint forces that are conservative or appear in directions that have no displacement. All right? So remember this. Constraint forces that are conservative or appear in a direction, in directions that have no displacement, will not do any virtual work. For example, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, forces that perform no virtual work, frictionless surface. Well, let's look. We have a force here and a force T2. If it had friction, T2 would be doing work if this, say, chair leg was moving to the right, or to the left for that matter. But as long as it's frictionless, then T2 is going to be equal to zero, isn't it? And T1 is perpendicular to the motion, so neither of these forces, this is zero, of course, and then T1 is perpendicular to the motion, so it can't do any work. If you have a pin, 
than the pen without friction, say. With or without friction. It doesn't really matter. It can't do any work. If you have a frictionless slot, this, this, this pen can move up and down in the slot freely, but can't move perpendicular to the slot. If, if it moved perpendicular to the slot, then it would be allowed to do work with the non-zero T4. But T5 is equal to zero, and so then it must not be able to do, there's no work being done. If you have a system of several particles, each of them may be having some forces of constraint that perform no virtual work, and some applied forces that will perform virtual work over the vir virtual displacements, delta R sub I. There is some, of course, some forces you can apply that will do some work, but generally speaking, constraint, constraint forces uh, won't, um, and neither will they, if they're, especially if they're conservative. So let's call the forces of constraint that do no virtual work, if we can figure out which ones those might be, we'll call that, we'll define them with cap R sub I. Notice that it's um, bold here or in, as a vector. All right? And then all the other forces are F sub I. If the system is in static equilibrium, okay, the ith particle will be stationary, so F equals MA, this A is going to be equal to zero, so the sum of the forces is going to be equal to zero. So the sum of the forces that do work plus the sum of the forces that do no work is equal to zero. And this is true for each of these particles. So if you remember the virtual work, then really it was delta W is equal to the sum of F sub I dot delta R sub I. And then if we use equation one here, okay, and we substitute in, instead of just having F sub I now, we'll have F sub I plus R sub I. F sub I are now these forces that do work, and R sub I are the ones that don't. And that's their, that together is dot producted against delta R sub I to tell us what's going on. These are the ones that do work, these are the ones that don't. And the forces R sub I do no virtual work, so we have here that the, this particular part will go out to be zero. They don't do any virtual work. The only thing left over is the forces left that do work. This is the so-called principle of virtual work, where this are the externally applied forces, So if you remember that, for example, potential energy is equal to the negative of work, right? If you do work on a particular system, it gains potential energy. So putting work into sense something means that we're, uh, work being done. That means that potential energy is going up. So V is equal to minus W, and that's equal to negative of this, ver this uh, derivative term here. And if we use the virtual operator, delta V is equal to minus F delta R for conservative forces, okay, only when we're talking about conservative forces, and that's the reason for the subscript C here. If some of the for applied forces then are conservative, then we may write the sum of all the forces except constraint forces that do not work. That's equal to the sum of the conservative forces on the ith particle plus the sum of the non-conservative forces on the ith particle. The principle of virtual work then becomes delta W is equal to the summation of these conservative forces and then the non-conservative forces. And if we regroup, then we've got the, the virtual work done by the conservative forces. But wait a second, look up here, we've got this term or this term, and we can replace this with minus delta V. That's the reason we did this. We split the conservative and non-conservative parts out, is that we were trying to figure out what we could do with this potential function. Sometimes it's easy to find this potential function, and it's not so easy to figure out what the forces themselves are. So the virtual work altogether is equal to the, vert, the negative of, the, of this variational operator or virtual operator on the potential energy plus the virtual work done by non-conservative forces. The delta V, we might call that virtual potential energy. Okay, so how do we use this? It's going to feel like cheating because it's totally unfamiliar and it takes a bit of practice. So take a look and see what you think. If Let's, this is a, a cookbook method for doing this. Look at the problem as static. If the problem is static, if the problem is static, then we go on to number two. So then we might say, instead of no, we'd say yes. 
then we'll go on to number two. If it's dynamic, then you have to wait till we get to Lagrange's equations, which is a bit later on. If, if it's true, then if, is the problem easier to do by using the sum of forces equal to zero? Sometimes it is. If you use Newton's second law um, applied to static systems, sometimes it, it's easier. Um, if not, then go on. Find the geometric constraints. What is constraining the motion of the system? How can you write those things out? Draw generalized coordinates on the system. And all you need, of course, is just enough to descri describe the motion. You need enough coordinates that are independent and take care of, are equal to the number of degrees of freedom of your system. And these generalized coordinates are especially good whenever they're in directions con consistent with constraints. So try your coordinates to the application or in the direction of external forces. This is sometimes really handy. Write the geometric constraints in terms of the generalized coordinates, if you can. And then find the applied forces and the virtual work performed by virtual displacements, delta r sub i, that are consistent with the constraints. You cannot break the constraints. So for example, you know, you have yourself a situation where um, you have the pendulum with a pin and the bob. You can't just cut this and say that, oh, I'm just going to ignore the fact that, that maybe uh, we have a, a force of constraint here or something like that. You cannot do that. So then once you have this, from this fifth step, the geometric constraints and the, the applied forces, then we'll use all the equations from five and to revise six, your virtual work statement, until you have eliminated all extra delta of stuff terms. And you'll see what I mean when we get to it. How many different delta of stuff terms are necessary? It, this, it turns out that you need as many of these as there are degrees of freedom. So for example, we have group one about delta stuff one, stuff two, it's about delta stuff two. Delta stuff one and delta stuff two are going to be arbitrary in size. They're virtual displacements after all, and we can change them, their magnitude as we please. And they can't be zero, and they're definitely not a, dependent on each other. So then it turns out that this term and this term are equal, they have to be equal to zero. It turns out that that's actually going to be um, just algebra uh, away from giving you your answer. Okay, let's look at an example. It's easier to, to see this when we do it, and then you can go back and look at what I was talking about, the analysis method, to see if it makes sense then. All right, so scissors mechanism. And notice that we have, um, we'll have a distance between each of these pins, say, in a scissors mechanism. We'll call that distance A. All right, so it's, a, it's pretty much a well-laid-out system. We have point A here and point B. W and F are forces. W is basically like the weight of this block that's pulling down, and F is the force pulling at the scissors mechanism on the right-hand side to keep the weight from falling down and, and collapsing the system to the left. So what we'd like to find is what F is is a function of theta and W. And theta here, theta is given by this angle from the vertical over here to the initial, the, the angle of this leftmost arm, okay, as long as the system is static. All right, so to find the solution then, we're going to consider um, a few things along the way to get virtual work going. Is the problem static? Yeah, it turns out the system is static. We just uh, presumed it was. Is the problem easier with the sum of forces equal to zero? We would need to have free body diagrams for each of these bars, and there's one one, two, three, four, five, six bars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pins that we'd have to worry about. Uh, if you have all day, yeah, it's great. Otherwise, no. Geometric constraints? Well, your point A, it moves vertically and only vertically. B, moves horizontally and only horizontally. So, and, and, and A and B are somehow related, isn't it? Does B totally move horizontally? Not quite, does it? It can move a little bit vertically as well. Hmm. But in any case, A and B are related, aren't they? So let's use X for the horizontal displacement of B and Y for the vertical displacement of A. Now, if we look over here, back at this figure, if we look at what we've got, if this angle here is theta, let's count how far, if we pick this point here as O, this distance to point A, 
is all right, this is cosine of A down to halfway down, another cosine of A. So this is 2A, come on, cosine of theta. And then along the horizontal direction, we'd have A sine theta, A sine theta, A sine theta, A sine theta, A sine theta. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5a sine theta from O to B. Okay, so y is equal to 5a sine theta. I'm sorry, um, we said x is a horizontal displacement, so x is equal to 5a sine theta, and then y is a vertical displacement, that's 2a cosine theta along the y direction, and then this along the x direction. So we're saying that we have our This direction is x, and this direction is y. So delta x and delta y and delta theta we're going to figure out as shown. So what we have to have is these have to be consistent with the constraints. Okay, again, so x is related to y and is related to theta in some manner consistent with the constraints. We can say that if we change theta, then we have to change y, and also we have to change x. And we have to change them in a particular way that's associated with the constraints of the system, how it's been defined. So, if we look, if we look at a virtual work statement, a virtual work is, is virtual work is delta w summation of f dot delta r, right? And we have our forces, we have our uh, weight going down, so in other words, this is W E sub X, E sub Y, I should say, right? And we have, along the horizontal direction, we have F E sub X, don't we? So we have, along the horizontal direction, F equals X, and downward, F E sub Y. You notice that if, if X goes outwards, okay, as X goes up, y, this block, also has to go up against w. So what that means is, is that our delta y is up when our delta x is out. So if we sum these two together, then let's look at x first. Delta x, okay, as a vector there. In other words, that's delta, delta x, e x, dotted with f, Okay, that's, this part turns out to be F delta X EX dot EX. And then we have to worry about the other one, where that's our W dot delta Y, right? And it turns out that that's actually W delta Y e sub y for the w downwards dotted with minus 1 e sub y because this displacement consistent with constraints is upwards whenever x is increasing. So we end up with, in the end of the day, as we end up with minus w times a minus dy, right, plus f dx, delta x is equal to 0. So it actually should be a plus here, shouldn't it? Thank you. So y is equal to 2a cosine theta, and x is equal to 5a sine theta. And notice that, remember I said that we have stuff times delta something plus stuff times delta something else? Now are these two related somehow? And they are, they're related through our constraints, aren't they? y is equal to 2a cosine theta, and x is equal to 5a sine theta. So delta y is equal to 2a minus sine theta delta theta, just derivative of this, and then delta x is equal to 5a cosine theta delta theta. We can substitute in for delta y and delta x here. It's 2a sine theta delta theta, and then 5a cosine theta delta theta, isn't it? So since delta theta is arbitrary, but not theory, and not, not zero, we can change theta, delta theta to be whatever it is we want it to be. We have only one degree of freedom then. Then the quantities over here, this quantity over here in parentheses, it has to be equal to zero.
So, in other words, if we solve for it, f is equal to 2 w divided by 5 times tangent theta. And this is the answer. That's all there is to it. So then the f is equal to the weight of the block times tangent of theta, whatever theta turns out to be, with the two-fifths in there. There's no simultaneous equations. There's no difficult algebra. But you'll notice that we don't have any information on what the system's internal loads are. If you wanted to design the system so that the pins wouldn't fail, you wouldn't have any guess as to what the forces on the pins themselves are. All you know is the relationship between the externally applied forces. The forces of constraint are not provided. There's no information provided about those forces of constraint in the system. Okay. Second example is a similar type of process. Linkage with arms length of length A each, and so we have two, two arms here, and they each have a mass M, and they have gravity pulling downwards here, as shown, and um, they're sitting in a system like shown. So we have a roller here on the right-hand side, and we have a force F holding the linkage up. Let's look for the equilibrium uh, position as a function of the, the mass of each of these linkages and the force F. So since we have equilibrium, the problem is stag static, and if you want to try to solve this problem using Newton's second law, then that's great. Go for it, but it's easier to do it this way. Let me show you how. So B is halfway between A and C, and C moves horizontally. And what we're looking at here is how the system moves to try to figure out how to define the constraints and all that. So C moves horizontally, and if we set X to be the distance A C, and then y to be the distance to the bar's center of gravity from line AC, then we can relate x and y, and indeed we can relate x and y through theta. Delta theta, delta y, and delta x are in the direction of increasing coordinate values as we've defined it here. So have x horizontally here, delta x is delta x increases, okay, and this is y, delta y increases theta, delta theta is increasing. And so then x is equal to 2a cosine theta, okay y is equal to one-half a sine theta, again, because it's from these, these pins down to the center of gravity. And so then if we take the, the derivative of these using the delta function here, delta x is equal to minus 2a sine theta delta theta, and delta y is equal to a over 2 cosine theta delta theta. Sorry about that. So then x is equal to 2a cosine theta, y is equal to 1 half a sine theta. Delta x is the derivative for this, and we end up with the delta theta at the end here. And we have delta theta for our y term as well. And so if we look at this a bit closer, then we see what kind of work is being done. Um, so virtual displacement, it's right f dot delta r every time. So we have mg going downwards. and if delta y is positive downwards, the same direction, then we have two of these masses, 2mg delta y plus f delta x, as x is increasing along the right hand side, f delta x, and add the two together and we get virtual work and they're saying that through a virtual displacement, consistent with the constraints, that virtual work would be equal to zero. We know that y and x are both related to theta. As shown here, delta w is equal to 2 mg a over 2 cosine theta delta theta minus f times 2a sine theta delta theta. And so then mga cosine theta minus 2af sine theta delta theta is equal to zero. So in other words, delta theta here is, isn't going to be equal to zero. So the term in the parentheses has to be equal to zero, and that means that mg is equal to 2f tangent theta, and we're able to find how theta is related back to 
the m and f, as shown here, theta is equal to inverse tangent of mg divided by 2f. That's the angle of our system. Again, we didn't find any constraint forces, but we found what the relationship between the, the, the weight of each of these bars is in f and the angle theta, the configuration of the system. Okay, so I'm sure that it's probably not all that clear, and I hope that you take the time to actually go through these and see how you go. And um, we'll look at these together in class.